All right. Thanks, everyone, again, for joining us for this call uh, to speak about uh, Louis Vitale and his book, Love is What Matters. Uh, so, inv again, inviting Ken Butt again to share a little bit about uh, Louis and the book itself uh, to, to get us started. Ken? Thanks, Ryan. Well, what a privilege to be able to celebrate Louis Vitale and to reflect on the book that um, draws together a collection of his writings over the years. I thought I would just start with the first memory I have with Louis and then um, a recent memory and then kind of take us through the book a bit and then open it up for reflections and stories. Quite likely a number of us on the uh, on this webinar have um, have known Louis or worked with Louis. Uh, but uh, I first met Louis Vitale in 1980. For uh, some of us had started um, an effort to try to respond to the U.S. wars in Central America called the Pledge of Resistance. And we got rolling in San Francisco, California. We decided we would have, a, um, we would have an event at the federal building there uh, to announce this new uh, campaign. Uh, the campaign notion was that we ask people to take a pledge to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience or legal protest if the U.S. escalated its military intervention in Central America. And um, uh, civil disobedience and legal protest. And so uh, we had this gathering and um, at, really at the last moment we said, oh, well, why don't we have an open mic as part of it? And we didn't know if people would, would uh, share. There were about 900 people who had shown up that day on a uh, lunchtime. I think it was a Tuesday in October. And, um, and we opened up the mic and it was powerful. Uh, we hadn't expected to hear the stories of veterans who had been in Vietnam or those who worked in the sanctuary movement who knew uh, Central America refugees personally that had a relationship with them or um, or, or just uh, grieving where under the Reagan administration in those days, uh, the country was, was headed. So I'm in line uh, and uh, I'm right behind Louis Vitale. He doesn't know me, but uh, I know him. Now, Louis, even at that point, um, was, was a fairly um, notable uh, activist, at least in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, he'd also been very involved in the sanctuary movement. He was the provincial of the St. Barbara province. So, um, and I also knew he helped fund really great social justice projects. So I, uh, I uh, introduced myself and I said, we're, we're helping to organize the event today and we hope this thing really builds. And, um, and I said, we really need some funding. We're, we have very little money. And he says, uh, oh, what, what do you need? And uh, I said, well, we could really use about $6,000 uh, to uh, do some, uh, some payroll. And he, he looked very noncommittal and very focused on the action. He says, oh, OK. So turns around, goes up, gives a really great um, testimonial as to why he was taking the pledge. About a week later, I get a, um, I get a letter from him and a check for $6,000 pops out. And I was really moved by the fact that he had, he had heard what I was saying. And then he became this amazing support person. And I've heard many, many stories since then about how as provincial, he reoriented the work of that whole province around justice and peace he, um, he took some risks in, in being the fiscal sponsor for the, for the uh, sanctuary movement. Um, and that was the beginning of a, a really beautiful friendship. Uh, I then went to work with Louis uh, at the end of my time working for the Pledge of Resistance. I worked for three years in the Bay Area, and then, we, then I moved to uh, San Francisco, where he was the national coordinator of the Pledge. And at the end of uh, 19, the 1980s, I decided to move back to the Bay Area and do something else. And, and Louis um, caught up with me in Washington just before I left and said, well, you ought to come work for us 
at Pace Bene, which we've just started. Pace Bene meaning peace and goodness was a phrase of St. Francis that he used as a form of greeting. And um, uh, we had some discernment. I, I flew to, of all places, Las Vegas, Nevada, which was where they had started this because it was just down the road from the Nevada test site uh, where a number of them were taking action almost daily around nuclear testing. Um, nuclear testing had been go going on there for, um, on, on average, once every 18 days since 1951. And they had this outrageous vision of actually ending nuclear testing there and helping to create a comprehensive test ban treaty. But then they would be driving people to the airport after they would get sprung from jail, and they'd start talking about the culture of violence. So they decided, well, rather than just on 10-minute trips to the airport, we're going to start an organization that would focus on going more deeply into this uh, situation. And so um, I got to know Louis. I went to work for the Franciscans. At that time, it was still part of the province, Pace Bene. And I've been there ever since. I'm a kind of a lifer. And um, all the way through, Louis has been this powerful, beautiful, resilient, uh, modern day St. Francis in so many ways, which will we'll get into in, in our time uh, this evening. Uh, I'm very moved by the notion of the communion of saints, the living and the dead that are, that are alive with the spirit of the nonviolent Jesus and the nonviolent God. And um, Louis Vitali has been that example, exemplum for me in many ways, for me, but for many other people. And I guess the last little story I'd share, um, I, I write about at the beginning of the book in the introduction to this collection that, that Pace Bene put together a couple years ago um, called Love is What Matters, uh, where I tell this story that in, in 2012, Louis was given an honorary doctorate at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. I live in Chicago, so I was able to host Louis, and we went down for the celebration. And it was um, it was a packed uh, hall. Um, of course, graduation very exciting for the uh, students and their families. Two scholars get up to get their honorary doctorates, and they're very scholarly, very uh, detailed and theological, and in in some ways abstract. And, uh, and, but all good, everybody was uh, excited to hear their wisdom. And then Louis gets up and basically he just says, I love everyone here. I love everyone here. Love is what matters. Love is what matters. Love is what matters. And then he sat down. <laughs> and the place erupted. They just responded to this heartfelt, genuine, cut to the chase kind of person who delivered the, the heart of the matter, that love is what matters. And um, I've seen Louis putting that love into action, nonviolent action, liberating, challenging, audacious, and relentless. Um, for all those years since I've known him, and of course people have known him before that when he was it, it, like this as well. So, um, so we put this book together because um, over the years, Louis had written different things and, um, and we wanted that wisdom in one place. And so uh, the, the book is divided into several parts. The first focuses on uh, his vision of Francis and Claire. Uh, the second um, part is uh, his um, accounts from jail, letters from jail, um, which are, I think, probably the most powerful part of the, of the book. Um, and then uh, you have the, um, you have the, uh, a series of writings over the years on various issues of justice and peace and, and nonviolence. Um, and, and then a, a whole sense of where we could be going to a new world of, of nonviolence. 
And, um, and then he starts the book with his own sort of autobiographical reflections uh, on, his, on his life. Uh, so um, if we've all read the book, I don't have to go into a lot of detail here, but you know, in that autobiography, it's pretty amazing. He, um, he uh, and it parallels in some ways, St. Francis of Assisi. He was born to wealth uh, in, Los, in Los Angeles, California. He, um, he went to military school. He went from there, essentially, he took some classes at Loyola in, in Southern California, but then, he, then he, um, he joins the Air Force. He has a pivotal experience, just like Francis did when he was a soldier. Uh, he didn't become a prisoner of war like Francis. He didn't see hand-to-hand -hand combat like Francis. But he was on a plane that almost shot down a supposed Russian uh, attack plane that was going to bomb the United States. And he countermanded orders. And he says, well, let's go up and look. And they said, no, you don't do that. You've got to shoot that plane down as soon as possible. And he basically disobeyed those orders, went up, he, and, uh, and checked it out and saw a gra uh, grandmotherly uh, older woman waving to him from a commercial airline. And um, that played a very, very important role in his decision not to make the military career and actually to become a priest and then to become a Franciscan. Um, and of course he grows up in the 1960s where if you, were, if you had eyes to see and ears to hear, you um, became very aware of issues of justice that the, that the church was opening up through Vatican II. He had some mentors in seminary and in the province who had been working on justice and peace for many decades, and he learned from them. And then um, he uh, got very involved with the United Farm Workers and Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, uh, trying to uh, see the um, rights the human rights of the, uh, of the migrant poor, people in the fields who didn't even have an address, and yet um, uh, Chavez and Huerta were, were organizing these folks. He got very involved in those efforts, and then he got very involved in the resistance to the war in Vietnam uh, by um, supporting young people who were um, refusing to, to be drafted and turning in their draft cards and facing prison. And he became a counselor for them and very involved, not just from a distance, but very involved in that, in that movement. And then um, he is, you know, he's in Los Angeles. The bishop is getting tired of him. And so he gets exiled to another part of the archdiocese, which is in, at, in those days, Las Vegas. Las Vegas was part of the Los Angeles Diocese in the, in the 1960s. So he gets exiled to Nevada. He gets there. He immediately gets involved in um, poverty, anti-poverty issues. And he has a conversation with somebody who says, you know, it's one thing to end the Vietnam War, but if we allow the continuation of the nuclear weapon systems in this country and around the world, um, we're going to face something much larger than Vietnam. And that got him thinking, and he and some others started wandering out to the Nevada test site about 65 miles north of Las Vegas is the southern gate of the test site. And on the 800th anniversary of uh, St. Francis's uh, uh, birth, they, um, they traveled out there in a very simple, contemplative, meditative way to pray in the desert. Ended up doing that for 40 days. And on the last, on the Good Friday, this was during Lent, on Good Friday, they crossed the line into the test site, thinking they might be away, put away for years in this top secret nuclear facility. Uh, they spent a, a little time in jail, in fact, over the Easter weekend, and then were released. And then they thought a lot about that and said, maybe we should come back and do this more. And that really began something called the Nevada Desert Experience. And Louis became a very, very important part of that organizing, um, which in the end, after thousands of people had gotten their sort of kindergarten experience of nonviolence, going to a place that eventually it was pretty easy to get arrested at because so many people came up that the local authorities said, we can't, we can't deal with them. So they just issued tickets and never acted on them. 
except in a few choice cases. And, uh, and Louis's deep and ex in intensive experience, which he t writes about in these various chapters, of really seeing that going to jail is a kind of spiritual retreat. Uh, it's a process of, of spiritual transformation and a call to the, to the nation and the world and the culture also for that kind of transformation. And then they start Pace Bene, and it's one thing after another in the, in the 90s and into the 2000s. Um, and then Louis, once he um, leaves, the provincial, uh, leaves being provincial, once he w has established Pace Bene, um, and once he has um, uh, been a pastor for 13 years in a low-income neighborhood in San Francisco, California, including opening the church for homeless people to sleep in the pews every night and so on. He decides, I'm, now my real vocation begins and he starts to going, going to jail pretty seriously by taking action at the School of the Americas and also at Fort Huachuca in Arizona, which, um, which uh, trains soldiers in, in torture. And, um, and so uh, he's amazing. He's beautiful, he's powerful. Um, he's such a down to earth kind of person as you see in that story about getting a doctorate and then just a one sentence thing. So I think what I'd like to do is um, add one thing to what I've just shared and then we'll just open it up and reflect uh, if there are parts of the book that you read and you wanna reflect on or if you haven't read the book and you want me to read parts of it or share more about it or if you um, have stories, more, more importantly, if you have stories about Louis Vitale, that would be really awesome um, to, to share. So he, as I said, he went to prison five or six times in the, in the 2000s. And I love this at the end of one of his letters, which is basically on page 71 and 72 in the book. This is how he closes one of those As a nation, we have crossed a line that we had pledged we would never cross. Jesus boldly challenged every barrier to justice, fearlessly breaking the innumerable taboos, customs, and laws that dehumanize, destroy, or diminish human beings. His life and vision pushes me to say no to injustice and yes to love and action. As a Catholic Franciscan, I have in turn been deeply influenced by the vision and spirituality of Francis of Assisi, who brought Jesus's vision alive in concrete and powerful ways in his own time. In the 13th century, Francis had an enormous impact on society. Caught up at first in the merchant economy of his father and the grandeur of war, he became a participant and victim of war. After a year as a prisoner of war, he came to see the evil of war and violence. Though he had been or originally attracted to the valor and heroism of the Crusades, he realized that he could only approach our fellow creatures with gestures of openness and love. He rejected the Sultan's, uh, the Crusades' violence and passed through their lines to embrace the Sultan. Francis challenged the, challenged the brothers who followed him to live among Muslims and be subject to them in order to learn their truth. We must follow these insights if we wish to realize peace. And that was all the warm up for the, to this point. The cell door clangs shut. I am alone. Instead of trying to escape this solitude, I enter it deeply. This is where I am. Here in this empty cell, I have begun to experience prison in the way James W. Douglas in Resistance and Contemplation describes it, not as an interlude in a white middle-class existence, but as a stage of the way redefining the nature of my life. I have sensed this transformation little by little. These days are a journey into a new freedom and a slow transformation of being and identity, an invitation to enter my truest self and to follow the road of prayer and nonviolent witness wherever it will lead. I am in this little hermitage in the presence of God. 
in the presence of the Christ who gave his life for the healing and well-being of all. I am also in the presence of the vast cloud of witnesses, some of whom are represented in the icons that have multiplied in this cell, gifts sent to me from people everywhere. Oscar Romero, Martin Luther King Jr., Dorothy Day, Stephen Biko, the martyrs of El Salvador, John the 23rd. All those who have given their lives to fashion a more humane and human world. At the same time, I experience a deep connection with my fellow prisoners and with those outside these prison walls, including those who have sent me many letters and expressions of prayer and support. In my empty cell, I experience a growing awareness of the communion of saints and of the possibility of a world where the vast chasm of violence and injustice enforced by torture and war is bridged and transformed. Here, I feel a new sense of hope and await the coming of the reign of God. So those are words from Louis that have deeply, deeply touched me and touched me deeply when I first read that little crinkly letter that he, that he sent. So I would invite us, um, and Ryan can help us do this, to reflect if either on what you've heard or on stories about Louis or, or parts of this, this slender book that captures a whole life in its pages. Uh, we'll take a few minutes and just see what comes of it. Thanks. Yeah, and if, you, uh, if you're muted, um, I think some of you who are using computer, you, you should be able to go ahead and unmute yourself. And uh, if you're on the phone, I, I'll check in with you and see if uh, you have any thoughts or questions. You can also, uh, I think if you're on the computer, use the chat function as well uh, if you want to share any stories uh, or thoughts or questions around the book itself. So uh, anybody have anything to, to share or to add to, to this conversation? Sherry, how about you? Sherry, can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> just a second, I'm gonna turn off my car and just go on the doctor. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now still? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, well, it's been my privilege to accompany Louis for the last more than a decade. <clears throat> and I, as I was listening to the profound words um, that he's written, um, I also am remembering his um, vulnerability and his quietude and his um, real humility. Um, I'm remembering being in <clears throat> palace, excuse me, <coughs> in Palestine in 2009 for Christmas. And we were headed to the Gaza Freedom March in Cairo with David Hartso and several other, and Jan Hartso and several other friends. But we went to Palestine first for 10 days on a, on visited lots of places that were, <clears throat> that were shared places of nonviolence between Israelis and, and Palestinians. And that was the intention of our trip. And Louis got a chance to celebrate Christmas Eve Mass with the Patriarch of Jerusalem. And you would have thought that this was, you know, Jesus himself coming. Um, he was so delighted and so excited to be in the place of, you know, Jesus's birth <clears throat> and his suffering and to actually have an opportunity to say Mass um, there. And it just, it's a it's a memory that I, I will cherish for a long time. And then we get, to, we get to Cairo and we're blocked by the Egyptian government from actually going into Gaza. Of the 1,400 of us that who went there, only 100 were allowed to go and the rest of us took over the streets of Cairo. So I remember sitting, you know, Louis saying, well, when is it gonna happen? When is it gonna happen? We're sitting on, on benches all over the city <clears throat> reading newspapers and having snacks and pretending like nothing was going on. And then at a, at a moment, out of the um, subway area comes the leaders from Code Pink with a huge flag that we all just, it was a, it was a big action and we all joined up and um, 
followed them and were surrounded and arrested and, and planned to literally stay, stay there for four days. And <clears throat> his whole beingness was, he was very restless while we we're sitting on the bench and just absolutely delighted to be, you know, be in the middle of the fray and be speaking out and standing up for justice and peace. And <clears throat> I have so many stories of that. He's, uh, for those of listeners who are not aware, Louis is, is turning 85 on June 1st. <clears throat> and he's lost some of his capacity as far as memories and so forth, but he's still vitally passionate and compassionate um, mm -hmm. about peace and justice and um, wishes he could still be getting arrested up at Beale and, mm -hmm. and elsewhere and is in constant solidarity with all of you as you do those and in, send his, sends his love as each one of us goes out on the streets where he wishes he could be. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. Appreciate that. Yeah, I was just thinking of my, uh, one of my first experiences with Louis because I, I used to live at the Catholic Worker in Las Vegas. And uh, we, of course, went out to the, the Nevada test site uh, many times during my years there. And uh, uh, my earliest memory of Louis at that time was being out there and just kind of walking in the desert with him, uh, this brown robed, a uh, figure uh, lining the kind of the backdrop with the, of the desert there. And I remember we, you, the, the, the kind of tradition of course, is that you go to the, uh, the, the property line on the street and you, some will kneel down and say prayer and cross over, cross over this line. And then just off to the side are basically pin, <coughs> pins for people to, uh, to hold, uh, women on one side and men on the other, uh, while the police process each person coming through. And they, so Louis went across, and I, I would have thought, you know, they'd be very familiar with, with the Franciscans and Louis, but Louis somehow got across and they started taking him to the women's side because of uh, his, his robe. <laughs> And he just went with it, you know, and then, you know, he finally, he had his hood on. So, uh, but after, after he took it off, then they, they realized their mistake and shifted him over to the men's side. But, but it was really a kind of a comical thing. And you, you can imagine Louis, of course, he just got a kick out of it all. And, and it's so, so uh, fun and uh, lighthearted about all of this. And um, it, as well as, you know, taking, understanding the seriousness of what he's doing too. But, it was just a kind of a, a lighthearted, you know, kind of a, a, but also a powerful moment when you're, you're kind of putting your body across the line into this, this um, place of death. And, you know, but you can also find, find uh, kind of hope and, and, and lightheartedness uh, with Louis. So it was a good uh, experience in that respect. Uh, so anybody else have other stories to share that they'd, they'd like to say a few words about, about Louis? So um, this is Patrick. Um, and I just want to share a story, not about necessarily about Louis, but about Louis's impact on other people. Um, um, some of you may have remembered several years ago, I guess it was about three years ago now or four years ago, um, we and, and other groups organized a 30 day hunger fast in Washington, DC around immigration. It was called Fast for Families. We set up tents on the uh, mall in Washington, DC. And one of the key organizers of this was Eliseo Medina, who also was one of the uh, leaders of the farm workers. Um, and it was also, it was myself, Eliseo. One night we were sitting around in the tent. Um, we'd been fasting for, I don't know, it was probably six or seven days at this point. And, and as I said, Eliseo, myself, Scott Wright, who, who many of you know, and several others were there. And we just started sharing stories of how Louis had influenced the work that we've done over the years. And it was kind of really, you know, interesting. And Eliseo especially talked about, I know Ken mentioned the uh, um, farm workers. Eliseo went into much more in depth about the impact that Louis had on the whole organizing of the farm, farm workers, including opening up the friaries to the farm workers when the strikes were going on and allowing the farm workers to stay in the friaries um, and providing food uh, for the farm workers during all of the strikes in those days. Um, and so it really was um, 
the powerful experience of hearing stories from each of us of the effect Louis um, had had on us. And then also, and Sherry, you can share this with Louis, a group of us uh, a couple of weeks ago got arrested in Washington, D.C. Uh, we did a prayer vigil in the Senate office building to protest the budget. And uh, seven of us got arrested. And as they were taking us away in, uh, into the um, police van, we were sitting there waiting for us to drive us away. And again, these are all people who had have had interactions with Louis at one point, or most of them. A couple didn't, but most of us did. And um, we all sort of said, let's have a moment of silence in honor of Louis as we're sitting in the police um, van, thinking that, you know, he was there with us in spirit. So Sherry shared that with him that even though he couldn't be there to get arrested with us, we knew he was with us in spirit a couple weeks ago. Thanks, Patrick. Appreciate that. Uh, Mariano, you wanted to, to share? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, and thanks, Ken, for, for the summary. I, I have not read the book, so, um, but I know of Louis mainly. My first introduction to Louis was when I was going to, uh, to the Franciscan School of Theology in Berkeley getting my master's. I think probably would have been around 2003, and I took his nonviolence class. And I, I think, Ken, I don't know if you were teaching with him or if it was um, some other folks, but uh, Louis was giving his his course there. And that's where I got introduced to uh, Pache Bene. And I subsequently uh, took the, um, the nonviolence to wholeness course afterwards and got more exposed to Pache Bene. But uh, I think what, and, and learning about uh, nonviolent uh, uh, actions and stuff like that, and which subsequently led me to joining Pache Bene and the board. Um, but the interesting part about it before I started all this was that my first round of community organizing actually started in the city of Alameda, where I grew up since I was four years old, and we were trying to save uh, these naval housing uh, in the city of Alameda and turn them, turn them into affordable workforce housing. And the funny thing is the, the person that I was doing the community organizing with was actually Ken's wife, Cynthia uh, Okayama Dabke. And so, um, and so that's how I actually ended up meeting Ken eventually <laughs> once I found out they were married. So, uh, so my whole, I, I don't know, it's that synergistic, you know, how things just kind of align <laughs> that eventually I became an activist, so to speak. Um, and I remember um, first going to the Nevada desert experience uh, when we had a Pache Bene a board meeting in Nevada. And then um, afterwards we did do the action uh, and so it was nice to be able to see that uh, process there. Uh, and so, you know, you know, when you're around Louie, you know, I, I guess it, it sort of starts to grow on you. And then finally, my, my badge of honor finally occurred one day when I went to um, the Lawrence Livermore action on the Good Friday uh, action that they have at Lawrence Livermore uh, in 2004 after I graduated. And after I married Maria, my wife uh, uh, currently, and we went to the action, I, you know, I got exposed to it. I got to see everything going on. I saw people, you know, lining up to, you know, get arrested. And I don't know, something deep down inside of me was saying, okay, Mario, you got to do this now. You got to do this now. You got to do this now. And I was really scared because I, I, I've never been arrested before. So I'm asking folks, well, what are they going to do to me, you know? And, and at the time, just to give you a little short, my wife was undocumented. So she was really yeah. fearful yeah. of me getting arrested. But I said, I said, sweetie, this is just calling me. So I did. I, I knelt down at the line with everybody else who was ready to get arrested. And I crossed the line and, you know, long story short, I did get arrested. And, and after, you know, getting arrested with all these folks in there, you know, and ha half the folks, are there, how many times have you been arrested? Oh, about 25 times, 30 times. And it's like, oh, this is no big deal. 
You know, they put us in a pen, pen for two or three hours or whatever, and then they release us. And so it's like, oh, it's no big deal. So anyways, that's my short story and experience in working with Louie and Pache Bene. And unfortunately, when I've moved up now to Sacramento, I haven't been as involved with activist work and with the new changes that are coming with the current administration, something is, is deep, deep down inside of me saying, Mariana, it's time for you to get out there again and start doing something locally in Sacramento since now I'm in the capital of California. And, but I, I just got to figure out how to connect in with the right groups mm -hmm. um, to, to start making things happen. And so, so hopefully uh, I'm going to get going again and try to do something here uh, in, in Sacramento to um, continue, you know, what Louis, what Pache Bene, what Ken and all have been doing for many years. I'm still a neophyte at this, but I, I know my heart is wanting, <laughs> something's calling me again at this time to get involved. Thanks, Mariana. Really, really powerful, Mariana. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Looks like uh, I think Sherry uh, had uh, something to say. Sherry? Yeah, I, um, Louis will be delighted when he hears this recording and hears all the wonderful inspiration. And I wanted to share just a quick story because we were just with him. Um, Louis and Martin Sheen are very close, and I've been a fan of Martin Sheen since forever and hold him in, in very dear value. And But Louis is is an equalizer to famous people. <laughs> <laughs> and he always tells the story of how Martin came to visit him in Lompoc and all the guards were just, you know, raising um, Martin Sheen up on, you know, golden, golden calf, if you will. Um, and, oh my God, oh my God. And even, and the um, head of the prison came down, the warden came down and wanted to meet him. And he asked to visit Louis and he took Martin to Louis, to Louis cell. Uh, Louis did not know this was going to happen and um, said, what are you doing here, essentially? And, um, and so um, uh, the, um, just a second, I'm, there's a, somebody here, um, and said, what are you doing here? And um, what happened was they saw that Louis had a whole bunch of extra books and they confiscated the books, which they would not have seen had Martin not visited. And so <laughs> he will be forever annoyed with Martin Sheen for taking away his books <laughs> by visiting him in prison <laughs> and being such a big deal. So they have, they have a very fun relationship. We've done a lot of fire, fireside chats, if you will, with the two of them. And um, they just have such a beautiful and charming relationship and, and love for each other. And it's just really fun to see them, their humor and their um, bantering together. So our Louis has not lost his wonderful jovial self in the midst of um, all, the, all the deep things that are going on in the universe. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, let's see. I want to see if uh, any others have something to share. I don't know if uh, Debbie, if you're there, if you have anything to share. I don't know if your your mic is is working. Um, how about um, Scott? If did you have any thoughts or questions? I just unmuted you. If you have any comments or anything to share, I'll uh, I'll jump in. I I don't know Louis. Mm -hmm. I was introduced to him through you all and. Um, your promotion of the book. And the thing that I'm really bringing in tonight is this, um, this felt sense and this curiosity about what the truly transformational force mm. of change is. And my sense of that, inspired by Merton and Daniel Berrigan, is that it's, it's subtle, spiritual, energy maybe we could call it love mm -hmm. yeah. but i'm curious how louis related to that this idea that it's not our not our doing not our preferences that really creates the change but it's this subtle energy that we participate in with with our open heartedness and our love mm -hmm. so I, yeah if you'd like to take a shot at that i'd love to <laughs> 
responses. Ken, you thoughts? Maybe, maybe I could start. Thank yeah. you, thank you, Scott, for that, and thanks for your work and everyone's work on this on this call. So one of the things that was the greatest gift to go to this really ramshackle place where that Pache Bene had on on the west side of uh, of Las Vegas, which is a low income neighborhood. Uh, there was a, a chapel and um, we would have mass every morning and to have uh, to see Louis get there an hour or two ahead and just go into deep contemplative prayer and 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 to see when he did celebrate mass he didn't do that every time but when he did to see the the mystical prayerful um, awareness of the 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 power of that sacrament of nonviolence. And uh, I saw Louis is, he's got all the quirks anybody else has. He's, and he, he's got the whole range of emotional responses to human life, but it's that wholeness that, that, that sees that as part of it, but also that, that giving himself to the spirit the Holy Spirit of, of nonviolence and justice. I saw it time and time and time and time again. Uh, Mariano mentioned that we taught a course, it's called Liberating Nonviolence. We taught it 13 times at the Franciscan School of Theology. And the, the way he was so present to those students, and we would always start with just really liturgical wildness <laughs> at the beginning of each of those classes and real heartfelt sharing of who people were, where they, where they uh, are. I, I, and and I, think, I think it is the thing that, while it's not his doing, it, it is being, but it's following, he is, he voluntarily followed a thread and he follows a thread today uh, that says, I'm going toward more life. And that was true in the Nevada desert or in these places that Sherry mentioned in Cairo. He went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki a few years ago and, and was at the heart of that reality that, that uh, the atomic bombings there. Uh, lots of other places, he was in Amman and refugee camps um, and, other, and many other places, India, but he he is fully alive in each moment, and and that's what I that I I think what you named I I saw a lot in in Louis Scott. I'm also reminded just talking about his being, his presence, his his humility, and often how he you know his speaking of the 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 place in Las Vegas that they had he would his preference of place to sleep, his room, was always this shed on the outside of the building. <laughs> that, that was basically the, you know, the most humble of rooms that you could find in this little complex. Boarded, just plain boards on the inside, a room for basically one twin bed. and uh, Just a very simple, simple structure. And that's kind of what he, you know, longed to be. He wanted to retire there. He thought it was just uh, the best. And, um, you know, he's, he's just an incredible kind of uh, human being in that sense. Um, I just, uh, let's see. Oh, so Carol Bragg wrote, just wrote in. She says, because uh, she's not, her mic isn't working, but she writes that she, uh, I've been trying to understand what the human barriers are to unconditional love, whether psychological or in our ways of thinking. That's why I decided to listen in. Any thoughts? So the understanding what the human barriers are to unconditional love, whether psychological or in our ways of thinking. Any, any, anybody have any comments or thoughts about that? Well, I'll, I'll jump in on that one a little bit. Um, I think our biggest psychological barrier is our egos. And, um, you know, the, our ego gets in the way of um, unconditional love. Yeah. So until we can completely surrender ourselves we never can be, um, we can never be loved unconditionally, nor can we give unconditional love. 
Um, so, and I, I also just wanted to comment on, on what Scott said also a little bit. Um, you know, I think it is the importance of being and being in, in the moment. And one of the things about St. Francis was um, he was in relationship with all of creation. And so, and I think that's what Father Louis too also is, it's about being in relationship with every moment and everything of creation, but also then to act on it. You know, we probably all know the story of St. Francis and the leper um, and how he embraced the leper. Um, you know, there's another part of the story that I've heard, I don't know how true or whether it's mythology or not, but another part of the story is that he then brought the lepers into the town, which was actually an act of nonviolent civil disobedience because it was against the law for lepers to come into the town. And so um, we learned from that it's not just about the, um, I mean, the action has to be not just the charity of embracing the poor and the marginalized, but then the action also uh, putting ourselves on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are we willing to take the cup of Jesus and, and drink from it? Um, so, and until we surrender ourselves to that, um, we're never going to be able to experience unconditional love or, or even give unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Patrick. And I think Louis, Louis had a gift for doing a lot of that pretty well, too, his, his ability to, to kind of uh, show unconditional love in a lot of ways was, was very evident. Um, great. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I would, oh, yeah, I would say, um, I think that Louis, like I said, I don't want to put him on a pedestal, but I would say, I think he did get to this place where at least the, the tendency toward the unconditional love was the default. Mm -hmm. and, and so some of us have to think that through, like, am I gonna be unconditionally loving now? And then is it unconditional? I don't know. But for Louis, it's like, that's just the operating system. And he may, he may blow that sometimes, but, but it's where he starts. And I mean, that's been my experience. It's why I wanted to hang with him. It's, it was a great, great privilege all those years, all these years to, to be in his presence, to see that, that, that love. And, and I think it, it's like what you were saying, Sherry, that, you know, he's fidgety until he's in the midst of the action. And then he's composed and centered. He knows his calling. He knows who he's, he is, he's acting in that, that sense of, of nonviolent love that Jesus taught us and, and wants us to live. And that means that connection to all things as, as uh, Patrick was saying. So I, that's to me, that sense of like the default. Now, how you get there? Well, I, you know, it's all those things we said, but um, I like this idea of acting our way into thinking and, and I, I, being around Louis, it was e easier to do that. Thanks, Ken. Uh, any other thoughts here? Um, I'm gonna, I, yeah. yeah, Mariana, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I, I'm also a, a life coach. And so when I work with clients, um, some of what we learn is our thoughts affect how we feel, which then determines what we'll do in terms of actions. So a lot of it from a psychological point of view, what are your thoughts? Are they positive? Are they negative? Are they loving? Are they hateful? Whatever those thoughts that are running through our brains determines how we may feel in any moment, right? And so if our thoughts are of real, true, unconditional love and our feelings, it drives what we're feeling, uh, I mean, and that's what I'm trying to always check myself. What am I feeling right now? And what's causing those feelings? What are those thoughts that are causing my feelings that will then drive whatever my action or inaction might be? So I think that's the, for me, the psychological portion. And then I think in terms, I agree with Patrick in terms of the ego. I'm always trying to put, know when my ego's coming out. I mean, it's there from a psychological point of view. So we can't really say, really throw it out because it's there. I think what I'm learning in terms of unconditional love is as I move closer towards my deepest, truest, authentic self, then I'm 
more able to live truly, passionately, and unconditionally, knowing that it's coming from my authentic self, which is connected to the divine. So, but it's a, it's, it's a lifelong journey, right? <laughs> For all of us. I, I, I don't think I'll ever be there, so to speak, because we're, we're human. Um, but I think, and, and I think that's where I try to listen to and what made me what drive towards, okay, Mariana, it's time for you to step over that line, you know, and get arrested is because I'm, I started to really listen to that deep, authentic self and what's driving me from the spirit. So that's my thoughts around uh, that. Thanks, Mariana. Thank you for the question, Carol. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see if uh, um, this other person, uh, area code 803, I don't know if you can uh, hear us. Hopefully you can and you can speak uh, if you have any questions. It, it, I'm not sure your name, but you have any thoughts or questions? Area code 803. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. Oh, great. Wow. It's so interesting because I started taking this course at the Avila Institute on Spiritual Direct, I mean, it's a Spiritual Direction Institute, and it's on evangelization. Uh, and so we're covering the new evangelization and, you know, how after Vatican II, um, you know, the, the various popes had the insights and, you know, how to, church had to respond to the, um, you know, to the, the 20th century. And so I'm just so excited here, you know, I don't know Louis, <laughs> and I, I can get some of you out of one of the uh, campaign on violence conferences and things like that. So I have to give a reflection for this course I'm taking, and I'm there, wow, God had me <laughs> listen in at this conference. So I could write my reflection, which is, you know, it has to be due after every course. And so at the end of like three months, then we look back. So I had no idea where. I wanted to go or where I was going to go, where is God leading me? But I think this is a great start and I'm so anxious to, I'm so honored to, you know, to be here and to hear from all of you. And I certainly want to read the book. So thank you so much. Uh, who, who, is, who is this? Just so we, we. Oh yeah. My name is Agnes. Oh, Agnes. Agnes. Yes. That's why I thought I recognized you. Yeah. In South Carolina. <laughs> great. This is Ryan. Okay. Oh, Ryan, great. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know whether I was on or not. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, thanks for joining us. I'm glad you could be on the call and for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Again, so um, uh, let's see. I think we're we're just about at time here. I, I one one thought. I was just looking at the cover of the book. Uh, if you, I don't know if you will have it, but you know, we we looked for a number of through a number of photos of Louie and trying to find the best one for the cover and. This one kind of always stood out for us. And uh, I don't know if it was Sherry or uh, somebody else who I was speaking to, but they said that, uh, that, that apparently the police officer, I don't know if it's this one or another one, it was in a similar action. The police officer was basically complaining uh, because it was, when, when his mother, the police officer's mother would see Louis, him, him arresting Louis, the mother would complain and say, why are you arresting this priest? He's doing good things. <laughs> so, uh, so I just always thought that was kind of a funny story <laughs> that would happen. So um, I guess any, any further thoughts before we, we close? I, I'm really grateful that uh, you all could join us. Uh, Ken? Well, I would say I'm really moved by our conversation over the last hour because it wasn't just um idolizing louis yeah. um but louis as he has his whole life leads us to to really reflect on how are we to be people of peace and nonviolence and transformation and especially at this historical moment and i know louis was that for me i mean he there have been certain figures that have that have really turned my life in a certain direction, Daniel Berrigan being one of them, uh, Thomas Merton, but, but Louis Vitale, 24-7, uh, and, and gets me to, to, to think and to feel and to act in a, in a, in a more nonviolent way, uh, invites me to that, doesn't compel me. And I, I just, I'm glad that this, was, this has been a time of kind of mulling on 
how do we go through that kind of that kind of transformation uh, so and and if we had more time i i know carol you've fasted a lot in your life louie is like one of these marathon fasters <laughs> <laughs> and and patrick you were mentioning fasting and he and i did a 21 day fast one time around homelessness in san francisco and and it really is like a sacrament of of emptying and and open, opening himself to joy. I'm, that's what I just saw all the time. And so anyway, I'm, I'm very pleased that we ha have had a, an opportunity to reflect on Louis. And I bet he figures out how to get arrested uh, <laughs> going forward in other, in other contexts. Right. Uh, I think Sherry uh, wanted to say another thing. Sherry? I just wanted to give a quote that Martin Sheen gave at the dinner we were at on Sunday, and it was about Davida Cody, but for when I heard it, it really um, represented Louis to me. And it's, if you are lucky enough to be inspired by people who live honest and dedicated lives, it always means you are called out from who you think you are to who it is um, possible for you to become. You are made aware of the needs of others, and the best way to identify with those needs is to, be, is to identify with their vulnerability. If you can nourish another's vulnerability, it is nothing short of a miracle. Wow. So. Thank you, Sherry. Very powerful. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Really grateful for you being here and all sharing your stories about Louis and uh, We'll celebrate uh, next week in spirit uh, for Louis's birthday on June 1st. <laughs> and, uh, and hopefully you all get a chance to, to read his book uh, sometime if you haven't already. But, uh, and I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.